if people could come in, if you have, uh, if you know people in the hallway that would like to attend the presentation, please ask them to come in. Uh, we're already a bit uh, running behind, so uh, we'll get started. All right, so today we'll be talking about CoreSight. Uh, the main slides will be on this panel here. And since CoreSight is full of acronym and it's fairly complex to wrap your head around, uh, I'm hoping to get a second support on the screen here where we'll put some of the, uh, the figures and the acronyms up as I go about. Okay, so this is the first of two sessions that we're going to have today. The first hour will concentrate on presenting what CoreSight is, what we do with CoreSight, why we want to use CoreSight uh, over something like JTAG, for instance. Um, my main goal here is to have you, um, if to, is to give you an idea of what Linaro is doing with CoreSight, uh, where we're at. This, so this will be for the first uh, presentation, will be uh, an introduction session. The second session, the second hour will be about uh, how to port new devices to the CoreSight framework that we have and um, a lot of the challenges that we are also faced. So in order to make this technology as ubiquitous and easily usable as a JTAG or F-Trace or PERF. Um, okay, so let's get started, all right? Um, so I just talked about um, like the broad scheme for today. For this presentation, we'll see what CoreSight is, why we want to use CoreSight, uh, the components going into this hardware tracing solution uh, will be presented as well. These are multiple blocks. Uh, just to, yeah, I just hold on. Um, so we'll present the CoreSight framework, the CoreSight framework being the infrastructure that Lidar is trying to upstream right now in order to represent, aggregate, and configure uh, CoreSight components in the system. Um, we'll also go through, once we have that, we'll go through, um, we'll demonstrate the steps that are required to have a, new, a minimal set of traces on the platform, any platform, uh, using the basic components. Um, we'll also look at our upstreaming strategy, and if we have time, we'll see what's coming into the next session and we'll take uh, comments and questions. I'm well aware that we are running behind, so I'll try to go uh, through this as quickly as possible so that we keep up with the schedule. Okay, so um, it took me a while to stumble on this picture here. So I had been working on CoreSight for about a couple of months before I stumbled on that. And once I did, the sky opened <coughs> up to me. All right, so this is probably, if there's one thing I'd like to, to come out of this talk, uh, remembering something that would be this picture. So there's a lot of acronyms, there's a lot of arrows. It like, it's, it might sound uh, or look a bit imposing, but it's not at all, right? So throughout this, this presentation, I will go through what the components here are, uh, what they're for, what, they're, what we use them for, and in the next session, we'll see what kind of problems they create, okay? So yeah, please put that picture up. So as I go about here, we'll have this image here on that screen, so you'll be able to see a bit where a bit of where I'm going with the talk. Okay, so um, course site hardware assisted tracing. It is a solution that you put into an SOC uh, at design time, at synthesis time. Okay, um, each of the block will provide functionality into a hardware assisted solution, uh, a solution that is uh, normally non intrusive. So we've all faced a situation where uh, something was wrong somewhere in the kernel or in software, you add some print case or instrumentation, and poof, your, your, your problem disappears. Uh, timing, interrupts, all sorts of things. Using course uh, these things should not happen, and the problem, despite the instrumentation, should still be there to be observed. Um, it's very useful for profiling and understanding where problems are in terms of performance and bugs in a very complex system. So I'll be talking about a holistic view of the system today. Uh, it's not concentrated on one processor or one set of processors running an operating system. So CoreSight is operating system agnostic. Uh, so you can debug solution or, or um, systems running different types of operating systems or no operating systems at all, right? As long as your CoreSight components have been configured properly, uh, operating systems should not matter. Okay, um, one of the cool thing about CoreSight is that it can be enabled or disabled at will. As I said, it's in the SOC at synthesis time, so you, it goes in the field with the rest of the product. The cool, the cool thing is that if you need it, you enable it. You don't need it, you switch it off, 
and it's there, it's dormant, it's not taking any power. Um, so yes, I talked about very complex scenarios. Okay, so we'll see uh, about that later as well. Um, if you are going to go uh, on InfoCenter and read about CoreSight, you'll also see that uh, they're talking about JTAG. So the CoreSight umbrella includes JTAG specification. Uh, we will not be talking about that, and the framework that Linero is uh, setting forth does not touch that either. Okay, so all we are concerned about here, and all Linero is trying to push upstream right now, is a solution to support hardware assisted tracing. Okay, um, the main reason why one would use CoreSight over JTAG is definitely uh, enhanced tracing capabilities. Um, there are there. Are, Definitely many advantages, but one of the main ones uh, the decoupling of the CPU state with the tracing engine. So if you have a JTAG uh, and you're, you'd like to debug um, cases where the CPU is going in and out of service, so switching on and off, it's very difficult simply because the JTAG will require that you have a constant connection with your target. Using uh, something like CoreSight, you can debug or trace uh, a processor coming in and out of service uh, seamlessly. As I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the state of the tracer is decoupled from the state of the CPU. Uh, tuning and configuration of the traces that you are, uh, of the scenario that you're tracing is also um, a lot, there's a lot more capabilities than what your regular JTAG. Um, with a JTAG, you simply start tracing, you have a whole lot of data coming in. With CoreSight, you can very tune, finely tune, when and want to stop or start tracing. Um, yeah, and I talked about a holistic view system, a multi-dimensional uh, um, aspect of this system, simply because CoreSight components can be tagged to anything that is intelligent in the system. And as such, you can debug at the same time all of these entities. Streams will be aggregated and sent out for uh, inspection later on. Okay, um, there's two different trace format, STM and ETM. So STM is uh, software trace microcell, ETM, embedded trace microcell. The ETM will definitely be at the micro level where the STM will be at uh, the macro. We'll see this later in the presentation when I go through the types of components that we have. So just uh, important to keep in mind that we have two types of tracers, uh, earlier versions. Earlier picture. There you go. All right. So um, our STM will be over here. So the STM is, is it's a standalone entity, whereas the PTM or the ETMs are coupled with uh, an application processor or anything that is able to write uh, or to execute instructions. Okay. So two tracers. Um, all right, again, on the, uh, the advantages of, of using CoreSight, uh, sometimes you are in scenarios where you can't stop a processor uh, for, tra for instruction, um, uh, instruction tracing, for instance, an assembly chain. It's not because you are tracing something that components that are being assembled uh, can be stopped. The vehicle in motion, like a car or a drone, so you can't have an extension cord going up with it. <laughs> And sometimes there are situations where you simply don't have a JTAG port, so uh, CoreSight is your friend. Right. Um, so uh, just just because we're, we're short on time here, uh, the main point in this slide here is to highlight uh, the traits of the, the tuning that CoreSight uh, gives. So address range comparators. When do you want to start and stop? So you can configure the tracers to start uh, when uh, the instruction pointers. <coughs> Uh, goes with a specific boundaries in your memory and stop when it goes out of that. Uh, single address tracing comparator. It does the, the the addresses don't have to be sequential, so you can decide to start and stop depending on any type of addresses that are being uh, fetched in the system. Uh, context ID and virtual ID tracing. So you would be able to trace based on a process that is being executed by a processor or a virtual machine. Right? So you can say if you have tons of uh, processes in your system, but there's only one that's of interest to you, simply program the context ID with the ID of that process. And every time that the CPU will be executing that process, you'll have the traces that are generated uh, through the, the, the program flow. 
um, input output from different uh, uh, places in the system. So um, the tracers uh, and the uh, the elements called uh, uh, cross trigger interface and cross trigger matrix. They have inputs for other parts of the system. So if you have a watchdog, for instance, and you don't always trust your software to do the right thing or collect the right information or write in the log that the watchdog has happened before rebooting the system, you can wire the output of the watchdog to cross-trigger matrix or an STM. You'll be guaranteed that you have your signal in the trace buffer. Um, all of these tunables can be mixed and matched together, meaning that you can say, I want to only trace on this context ID on that virtual machine within this address range. This is extremely powerful. This is something that you would not be able to do with a JTAG. Right? At least I would not know how to do this with a JTAG. Um, again, we're talking about the two different trace format, micro and macro, uh, STM and ETM, PTM. Right? Uh, two different uh, entities, two different trace protocols. Uh, it took me a while to figure that out. I've always thought that they were path for one type of entity and a path for another type. Absolutely not. So your tracers, the STM and the ETM, uh, will generate traces. Uh, for the ATM, it's a, it's a protocol called Program Flow Trace that will give um, uh, a summary of the path that the processor has taken through the code. That would be at the micro level. And at the macro level, uh, any entity on the, CP, on the system that is able to map a memory and write to that area of memory will be able to use an STM. The two, the two different outputs are packaged and are going into the core site system and end up exactly at the same place, either on a trace port for um, external extraction by something called a trace port analyzer or uh, an embedded trace buffer, which is a memory that is dedicated to core sites, a memory that is dedicated to traces, to collecting traces. As such, it does not occupy or clubber any other of your address or uh, memory resources in the system. OK, um, so we'll go back to this picture to describe the types of components that we have the system. Uh, I talked about the STM and the ETM. So these will be entities that will be generating the traces. They are called sources. At the other end of the spectrum, we have six. So the entities are collecting the trace data, right? So the things will typically be under over here, uh, the, TPI, the TPIU and the embedded trace buffer. Um, embedded trace buffer is a, a component that has uh, sometimes up to 32K or 64K uh, of, of buffer space. Again, that buffer is for that specific uh, component. It does not, um, does not clutter or does not occupy any other memory resources in the system. Right, this is dedicated memory for core site traces. Uh, trace port interface unit, this is actually pretty cool because it allows someone to collect traces in real time without having to worry about overflowing the buffer. So we can connect a trace port uh, interface to a trace port analyzer that would be uh, outside of your system. Collect traces for hours on end for as long as you have uh, disk space in your host that are collecting the data. So source and sync, sources are generating the data, syncs are aggregating them. Uh, in the middle, we have links. Uh, so um, uh, plumbing tools like a replicator and a funnel. The funnel will aggregate uh, streams, and uh, the replicator will split, uh, will split it out. So, so the above list uh, is not, is not uh, there are many more um, components in the core site architecture. These are the main ones that we currently support or envision to support to, in case of the, uh, the STM. Uh, so these components are already part of the framework that we're trying to upstream. But there's a few more that I haven't talked about that are also available for people to design a system with. So this is what a typical core site system will look like. So we have uh, the high level view of the system. This is a TC2. Um, uh, so we have, on this side here, our tracers that are associated to three A7 processors and two more tracers, the PTM, that are associated to the A15. In between there, we have uh, a funnel and a couple of replicators um, collecting trace data that are going into an ETB and a TPI. So, so the same components that we have on the generic diagram 
uh, improvements we found on a system like TC2 here. Uh, what is not on there that is in here is the ITM. Uh, the ITM is an early predecessor of uh, the STM today. So um, also exposes channel to uh, entities in the system, except that it simply does not package uh, information the same way. And the cross-trigger interfaces, as I mentioned, that are ways for the core site system to uh, have a better interaction and awareness of what is going on in the system. Uh, or with other components that might not be core site enabled. Okay, um, we talked about the two uh, um, uh, tracers that we have in STM and the PTM. I'm going to go quickly over this slide here simply because we are short on time. I think it's important to understand that there are two protocols, right? Program flow traces are associated with an ETM or a PTM, and um, STP, so standard uh, trace protocol, um, right, that are associated with the, uh, the STMs. Uh, on this point, on this slide here, my goal was to highlight that the program flow protocol will not output all of the instructions that are executed by a processor. It will uh, simply uh, uh, send out to the tracers uh, specific uh, events that have happened in the system, whether you have jumped to a specific address or you have taken a branch. So based on these and the original software view, like your VM Linux or uh, an ELF file, you're able to reconstruct the stream that or the flow of instruction that the CPU has executed. Um, program trace decoding is definitely not to be taken lightly. Uh, right now there are a few tools that are available for that. Uh, PTM to human is an awesome exercise. Uh, I have no clue who wrote it. I think it's definitely a good base for trace decoding. Um, I'd like to read that person. Um, so yeah, uh, hardware uh, GCC23 is the acronym that is posted on GitHub. I do not know uh, who that would be, but they've done a pretty good job. ARM ES5 is, is a professional tool by ARM. It also allows uh, for full trace decoding. Um, I have used it. Uh, the results are actually spectacular. You see exactly to the instructions uh, what the processor has done. Uh, on the flip side, it has um, the uh, pre uh, license is only 30 days long. So that's definitely a drawback. There are other tools. Uh, Texas Instrument has the um, Code Composer Studio. I did talk to the people at, at uh, TI. They were saying that code traces from processors uh, that are TI. Uh, I, I don't know how they do that, um, simply because uh, program flow trace don't have any, uh, the program flow trace itself does not have a marquee on the processor. So I'd have to see um, why that is a constraint for them. Uh, Loader back trace 32, awesome tool, I've seen it in action. I simply haven't had one on my desk. Um, and uh, last but not least, on trace decoding, Linero is definitely working on that. This is something that we have uh, recognized as being a problem. So having a tool that is yielding professional results, but at the same time being free and uh, open source. So this is something that we are talking about. This is something we have uh, in mind and we are keeping an eye on. OK. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, STM. So it's STPv2 protocol. The spec is over there. Uh, tools to decode that. Uh, ARM DS5 will also do it. I haven't tried it. I haven't had time to do that. Uh, ST Microelectronic and a um, company called uh, Leontal Electronics also have a decoder. Uh, both have been used uh, with successful results. All right, so now that, that we have a somewhat introduction on what Foresight is and what it does, uh, let's talk about the framework that uh, Linero is trying to uh, upstream to support all this. All right. So the work that um, Linero started working on this a while ago, except that we started putting uh, full-time resources back in Macau in, uh, in, in March of uh, this year. So we started with a framework with a, a submission that was done by Patrick Patel from Code Aurora 
uh, in 2012, right? So that um, that um, submission had support for uh, the basic entities that are on this component here, and uh, a way to aggregate them and configure them at the same time. So if you are to start tracing, you don't want to have to configure each and every component individually. So the framework will do that. Not only does it provide a way to uh, configure the components, but you can also uh, configure a path through the components, allowing you to get to a result where uh, traces are collected into a sync. Uh, so right now, the framework supports PTM v3.3 to 3.5, PTM 1.0, 1.1. Um, there was support for an STM in the original um, submission by uh, Code Raw, except that we had decided to remove it from. Uh, we decided to remove it from uh, our effort to start with, simply because we wanted to focus attention or people's attention on how the framework really works uh, in the foundation. And once we have that going, we can actually move on with uh, uh, components that require more uh, engineering, like an STM or a cross-trigger interface. Um, okay. So the code that we have is completely public. There's no secret. There's no black box. Everything is on there. Gia.lamaro.org. There's a core site tree. Uh, that tree is always rebased to the latest and greatest kernel. Um, look for the master branch. That's where it's at. Um, so once you have that code, everything sits under drivers, core site. Uh, no surprises there. And if you are to configure it, uh, go into kernel hacking and course like tracing support. That's where we have uh, put the configurables. Right now, um, the only thing you'll find in there are generic components. So components for uh, sources, sync, and links. Okay. So since March, we've gone through um, actually six iterations. I sent the sixth one two weeks ago. Uh, started re we, um, receiving comments on that. So. Um, also, on, on git.lunar.org, you'll see all of the submissions that we have, um, again, along with, um, and if you want to see uh, some of the, uh, the comments and the work that we've done since the beginning, uh, you can use these links to follow the submissions upstream. <coughs> okay, um, some of the highlights from the framework. Everything is DT, so everything is in the device stream. All the specifics uh, pertaining to the components themselves, so where they live in memory, so their memory map, the ports, the port topology between the components, everything is specified in the device tree. Uh, it's done in such a way that in order to port uh, uh, or to uh, enable a platform of course site, what should be needed is just the stuff, our um, a, a device tree specification. Everything else should be supported by drivers that are either already existing or drivers that are specific to a, uh, a tracer or uh, a components, right? So the drivers are there. Uh, the only thing that is required is a good device tree specification. So that's the ultimate goal. And right now, we've been able to do that with about three or four platforms. So we're not really out to lunch on this. Um, so once you have that going, the system is booted. All the configuration and configurables are done via debugfs. So everything is exposed to user space uh, in debugfs. Right? Uh, starting and stopping a trace is also done via debugfs. And the collection uh, of uh, trace data from the TV, for instance, goes into uh, devfs. Um, we also have, last but not least, we also have, uh, we started to do something for metadata. We'll talk about meta metadata later uh, in the second session but we started to do uh, work on how to export metadata to user space so that it can be uh, packaged with the trace stream for trace decoder to, uh, uh, to pick up. OK. Um, so once, once you have that configured, this is something that will come out on the console uh, when booting the kernel. So we have, it might be a bit small, a little bigger on my screen. Apologies for that. But typically, you'll have the name of the driver that's being instantiated along with um, the entry that you will find in debugfs. So the name of the component along with the memory map that has been assigned uh, by the hardware. So all that comes from the device tree. Uh, the advantage with this is that you can, um, uh, you can pinpoint which, which is which. Like, uh, for instance, tracers here. So what tracers is where. So it's easy to differentiate them simply based on their memory map. The only, the only um, 
you'll find even in the code, the only difference or the only exception is for replicators. Uh, replicators are hardware components that don't show up on the end of us. Right? As such, they don't have a memory map. Um, so we simply have a static variable that are implementing the, uh, um, an ID for the replicator. So replicators, if they are non uh, configurable, will not have a memory map. So where do you put them in the team? Come again? Where do you put them in the device tree? They are in the device tree exactly the same, um, in the same area that the other components are, except that we don't uh, post fix the declaration with uh, prime cell. Right? We, I did do a submission uh, early on without uh, replicators. Because, let's put it this, let's be blunt about it, they don't do anything with regards to software. But people got extremely confused and they literally asked me to put the replicators back, even if they don't do anything. Even if it's just for topology or being able to, to see where the ports are or how, how the ports are declared. Uh, Russell did not fire me on that either. So, fine. So, so use space program can do a graph visualization of the topology or interrogating curve. It would be awesome. I, I, th I, th I think you can do that. I think by exporting uh, the, the device to user space, you could have a, a user space tool that inspects the uh, uh, the ports and the components. The reason I bring that up is the chance of having that aircraft in the data sheets for all manufacturers or vanishing support. I know. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So we have to but but in, 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 it's something that would be fairly easy to do as well. All right. So. Um, just to continue here, so um, as I mentioned, everything that has been discovered through the device tree uh, is exported to uh, debugfs by the CoreSight framework. So again, taking our example about uh, TC2 here, we have all of our components. Right? All of the components that are on there, aside from uh, uh, the STM, is over here. Right? We have our replicators, <coughs> TB, the funnels, and our tracers. Okay. Um, and under each of these components, we have the specifics that are pertaining to them. So if you're looking at a trace buffer, there's not a whole lot that can happen. It's just a memory area, right? So we have uh, an enable trigger. Um, we have the status of uh, the engine itself and a trigger count, which is a 504 uh, indicator, right? Where you want to put your limit. If you're looking at a tracer here, there's a whole lot more configuration that you can do with that. Right? Some of them will be switches uh, to enable them or disable them. Others will be direct access to registers, allowing users to do exactly or specific configuration uh, for a tracer. So question with you. Yep. Are those, um, what will appear under debugfs for each of those components, are those standard across all platforms? So that specification says, you know, if it's a ETB or if it's a cross trigger interface, it must have these registers and that will always appear Super question. So that we'll see in the second session, where you have uh, components or you have configurables that are generic to a component and some of them that are specific to that component. And the framework allows you um, to have or will mandate that some of these are, config are, are, are present and some others are not. And you basically feed uh, the components that you want to expose to users via specific ways in the API of the framework. Right? So to answer Deepak's question, some of these are standard and some of these are pertaining to uh, that specific PTM right? from the R manufacturer in this instance, simply because um, all of the components that, that we currently support follow uh, the specification that are found or that is found on uh, Info Center. Okay, so what we're going to do now is take our, our platform, our system, and we'll show how uh, a minimal trace can be acquired. And what we'll do is we'll take the tracers that is associated to core zero on an A15, and we'll enable a path through the core site system all the way to the ETB, right? So we have two things to do. First, we're gonna enable, enable the sync, right? In a system, in order for traces to be collected, you need to enable at least one sync. You can have as many syncs as you want enabled. At least one has to be enabled, right? From there, we'll enable the source, and we'll let the framework take the path through the system from source to sync, 
right? This is the cool thing about the framework. You don't have to do that. You don't have to manage that. The framework will manage it for you. As long as it has a topology in the device tree, drivers for them, and a clear path between components, you don't have to do anything else and enable your sync and configure your source. So going back to um, our command line here, as I mentioned, we'll use uh, a tracer. So that's in the, uh, the upper line here. We'll use a tracer that is associated to PTM, uh, to CPU 0. And based on the memory map, this of the, uh, the system, um, this is the address that we find for CPU 0. Um, by default, when the framework boots, it will take all of the tracers and will configure the address range of the kernel as found in the system map. As such, you don't really have to do anything to test how healthy CoreSight is on your system. Right? This is a default configuration that is simply there for testing purposes. If people want to do uh, more advanced type of tracing, they will have to disable the default configuration and start putting up or start uh, configuring your own. Okay? So the only reason why we're able to do this so quickly or to test how healthy CoreSight is on the system is because the framework will do some default configuration. Okay, so uh, in my example here, uh, if I was to open the system map, I would find the two address that are in blue at the end of the line for uh, uh, S-text and E-text. So from there, as I mentioned, all we have to do is enable our sync. And once we have our sync enabled, uh, we can enable our source. So how do we know that it works? Well, it's easy. We query the status of the embedded trace buffer. And in that embedded trace buffer, look for the round right pointer. If the round right pointer is incrementing as you query, it means that traces are collected. Because a round right pointer is the next element in RAM in the ETB buffer that is writable. Okay? So now we have an example of how we can um, trigger traces. So once we are when we have traces in our buffer and we are satisfied with the amount of trace we've collected, simply switch off the traces the same way it was enabled by echoing zero to uh, the source. As I mentioned earlier, all of the traces uh, are collected uh, by the ETB buffer into the MFS. And in this case here, we only have one uh, embedded trace buffer, and it's at the end of the line for there. So DD the content into a file, like you would read any other file, and voila, at the end you have uh, uh, a binary file that is uh, encoded in the program flow traces. Is there a way you can ask the kernel to um, stop the tracing automatically when the thing you're tracing exits? So you don't have to do a round trip to user space, write zero to enable well, the, and so, so, potentially clobber out of the ETB with a right. so, zero. Right, so here, what we've done is simply enable tracing because we said trace everything that falls in the kernel space. Right? This is highly inefficient. It's solely to test you know, uh, how healthy course is on, your, is on your system. Normally, a tracer would have a stop and start condition that would do that by itself. Right? So you wouldn't have to, trace to stop the traces manually right? because you'll obviously overflow your buffer. Right? For context ID, for instance, if you, could, if you program the engine to trace what is just a specific uh, process, and then you do a DD or you read a file with that process, the shell instance, right? Right away, you will see that the right pointer is, not, is no longer incrementing once that process has exited. And that's how you would typically do it. Right? Um, so, what happens if the buffer does fill while you're tracing? Is there some sort of notification? You can't. So there's, there's some con configurables that can say, stop tracing as soon as your uh, trigger count is full. Right? Uh, in this case here, as I mentioned, it's solely for an example on how you would do minimal health check on your system for course Right? But everything is there uh, for you. You can either say overflow the buffer and then you, you recuperate the trace based on where the, the, the read and write pointers are at the FIFO. Or you can say stop whenever the buffer is full. Just what, one question. So, if you have, uh, like, say, for example, in this particular case, you're just tracing the CPU activity, right? So, at the same time, if you have like a start and a stop condition, and if the 
have like another source from like a DDR or something like that. It's also tracing like patterns of how the bursts of writes or reads are going through. You could pretty much it would, would it actually show up as a source in the DevFS? DebugFS? And you know, Well the source the sources that are showing up in DebugFS are uh, core site components. RAM, like RAM, the physical medium of RAM is not a core site component. It's not a tracer itself. No, but the DDR controller could be, right? It, the DDR controller is an engine. It's a hardware engine. It's not a core site engine. It's not a tracer. On the flip side, there are outputs to the DDR that you can connect to a cross-trigger matrix or an STM for that. Instance, oh. Right? As such, every time that there's an address line is triggered in some condition, you could see it in your stream. All right, so that's exactly, this is a perfect example of a cross-trigger matrix or an input-output to core site components. So is there like an IP block that needs to be there at the DDR controller? You would have that, but it does not exist. Right? There's no, there's no, there's no core site IP block for a DDR controller. There's a core site IP block for an application processor, right? But there's no such thing for a DDR controller. Again, that's why you have input and output uh, signals coming into the core side engines. But there would be like you know these statistics collectors in the DDR controllers, right? Like would that data somehow be able to feed into these packets? No, two different technology. You you can do. I mean, you can use things like O profile to get some of that data, right? That's more. That's more of the kind of data you would correct. That's more like hardware statistics that you're collecting. Is I think what you're talking about, and then you could feed that. That's one of the things I think we'll maybe talk in the advanced one, or something that still be looked at is how do we take that data that's being collected by other parts of the kernel, and then feed that into possibly a core site stream that can be accessed by an external debugger. If you want to have a single view of your whole whole system, you want to see what's happening in your application processor, what's happening in your GDR controller, your GPU, your DSPs, all in like. One right. So time sync frame. So probably in that in case, in this case, you could have an interrupt being generated. That the, 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 the interrupt handle associated to that write some specifics about that event into an SDM stream. Well, I actually send that around. Ninety-nine percent. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And it can show you on this dynamic path, you had a really bad cache uh, hit rate, but uh, on this other path, actually, it was okay. And that, that's the kind of information I think it's useful. But the problem with that. I mean, the PTM to human can go away because we can have it in the kernel tree until it's like that. Yeah, that, that was also my, my thought when, when you explained how this, how this actually fits together. Um, have you actually talked to any of the Perf developers about the interfaces here? I, I have been interacting with uh, the perf, not the Perf developer, but the Intel PT people over the last couple of weeks. Uh -huh. they, they sent something upstream that does specifically that, right? yeah. that, that takes a PT, uh, an Intel PT uh, trace dump and package it and export it via Perf. Right. Because I, my impression is that uh, to get this merged, it should really use the Perf interfaces, not have this an interface that's sort of doing the same things, just that. And I've, I've always been very vocal about the fact that we will be doing that. Right? So this, is, this is definitely something that's in the plan. Perf use case is also a subset right, of what this is capable of. Yeah. So I'm not saying get rid of what you've done. What you've done is it's, that's the really low, low level knobs, which if you know what you're doing, and, and you need that kind of uh, way to express stuff. And also when you've got non-standard components, you need those controls. But if you just want to, I mean, most people want to get you know, cycles. They care about that, so you can just use them. But things like this, just a basic where did I go, is also yep. useful. And you should just, but the, just the, the that, subset should be integrated right. into purpose self-hosted. But just to do that, there's so much plumbing yeah. that has to happen. Yeah, I, I didn't say it was easy. No, no, <laughs> that's exactly it. That's the point that we've been you know, driving home since day one. Just to do something like this, there's a whole lot of infrastructure that has to happen. And that's we're just trying to put our foot in the door, you know, put something out there so that people can start 
you know, coming in with us on it, because there's no way to do it alone. So the, the, one of the hard parts I see is that the ETV side uh, should be highly integrated into Perf, but the TPIU side can't be integrated into Perf using the local side, but how, how do you separate the two? Absolutely, right? Again, we think that by putting something out there, those questions will get solved by other people looking at, right? It's not a, a one brain thing. Like, smart people have to start looking at this and, and get input and get into, you know, the parade. Because there is a parade, right? And Matthew's going to be going to the uh, Tracy Mini Summit. Uh, yeah, that came in on Friday of last week. So uh, we're very happy about that. All right, so so we're very tight on time, I think. Right? Are we, what time is it now? Uh, it's 10.58. This session technically ends at 11. It's a 15 minute break for the second session. But you could just continue with it. Right. Well, I'm going to give people about 10 minutes and then come back. So I'm, really, I'm just going to go through the slides that I have here. Um, all right, so, so we have about five more minutes, okay? So bear with me here. So, um, all right, now that we have, uh, you know, a trace, uh, we have a tr we've collected a trace stream. We're very happy. We have tools to decode them to some extent. So what's next? Um, we already have a few platforms that are supported. Um, we're very happy about uh, having Lightweight join the, uh, the effort here. So they were able to support CoreSight under D01 and uh, support for uh, or device tree enhancement will go uh, into three point uh, the next version. Uh, uh, either three three seventeen or no three eighteen. I think they're scheduled to uh, be uh, to be merged. Um, we'd like to have a couple more platforms uh, supported. So the Qualcomm APQ eight seventy four and the OMAP five so fifty four thirty two byte Texas instrument. Uh, we are talking to those teams in order to, for them to provide us some of the, uh, the internal plumbing that we are missing. Um, uh, support for STM and STM 500. So these are the, uh, the macro trace engine that I talked about. We have drivers for those. They simply have not been added to the framework, again, to concentrate efforts on foundation rather than the more advanced topics. Uh, cross server interface, I talked as well. Uh, we have two, a few drivers to choose from right now. Uh, one is from Code Vera. The other one is from a fellow called John Hunter, who pushed his uh, driver to GitHub. Um, I wasn't able to find it last I checked, so might be, uh, I might ask Code Vera on that. Uh, we're also thinking about uh, Juno, so ARM V8 is definitely very high on our list of priority. I uh, should start working on that after Connect if things go well. We also have a bunch of questions like how do we uh, how do we trace application code? Uh, how do we integrate with other parts of the kernel? Um, and how do we play well with other people in the community that are doing the same? So MIPS has a harder tracing mechanism. So does Intel. So we have to keep an eye on what these people are doing in order not to reinvent the wheel that people are creating. OK, uh, we'll talk about challenges in the next session. and. Um, Questions and comments if you have some. So these are all of the, the links that I talked about in this presentation. Everything is open. Everything that we do on Foresight is open. If it's not open, we're not talking about it. Right? I've been asked to, uh, to not talk about something because documentation was not public. No, published documentation. Done. Right? And that publication got, got, got published. So, yes. So while we're the, the microphone is, is, is on its way, uh, the next session we'll talking we'll be talking about a courting guide. So what happens if you have a component that is specific or that has been enhanced from the base standard? And we'll talk about all the challenges that's associated with making this better. Yes. I assume core site is optional for SOCs. Yeah. What's well, your hold on a second. Sorry. Usually, when you have an application processor, you will have a tracer coming with it. That is strongly suggested that you do it, even if, yeah, even if it goes just to a simple ETV somewhere, right? I have, well, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it that. And one of the frustrating things about JTAG is that, um, although there's sort of um, a common convention of how to use it, SOC vendors are perfectly able. The, the specification is flexible enough that SOC vendors 
they don't have to implement the ID command or the programming command or even the JTAG testing right. command. Um, are SOC vendors flexible enough to be able to skirt conventions so that each one of them has, is it a command structure type of thing like JTAG? Or? No, it's not a command structure. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a register and, and standard type of thing. Right, so so the standard is there. You implement it. You can probably like skim out stuff from it. Is it to your advantage? Probably not, because this would not work. And hopefully, this will become ubiquitous, and people will say, "Hey, I want my SOC to work with a core site that's in Linux." Right, so get your house in order to do it. Uh, that's 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 the whole basically. There's some some enhancement that would come with drivers, right, specific for someone's component. There's absolutely no problem with having enhancement to the base standard, right? I see that uh, there are some ARM chips that don't necessarily run Linux, but have a core site infrastructure in them. Yeah. Uh, what's your feeling on how much of your work will be usable on a chip that might not be running Linux necessarily? Everything that's in the that's in the framework is uh, there's no black magic, right? They could start, they could take that, replace everything that is memory allocation or Linux specific to their, their, their OS or their specific environment. And it would work, right? It, yes, it would be a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of work or a lot of effort simply because it's, it's embedded into the device tree. And, and, but I don't see why people could not look at how things are configured. For instance, the sequence of access or steps that are, that are people accessing the registers and the values that are programming into registers to cater to specific use case to actually do their own. I've done that myself. Right? I've taken uh, uh, code from ARM that was not tailored to run on any operating system. And I've looked at you know, what they were doing and transposed it to that. I thought, I thought it was magical. Because I've uh, reused someone else's work. Just one more question, too. You listed a bunch of dongles, I think. I assume you need some sort of dongle to connect to the device. Are they pricey? Or? Don't know. No. One, of the, one of my big challenges is I have not been able to, to connect a TPIU uh, to a TPIU because I don't have the port. The port's not, like, the connector is not output on the board. So, just to come back, if you're not using TPIU, you don't need Right. So, I don't think. So, you mentioned device tree support here. Yeah. Are you going to also extend this to things like ACPI support as well? I don't have any plans for that right now. I, I right now, I've been. Yeah, no plan for that. And that would have to be up to ARM, I think. Because it seems like whatever they spe specify the topology in the live street has to become you know, the, the entry into the SDT, right? Or maybe there's a different table to, to go along with this. Yeah, it's probably not possible, but they're so far away from getting an SDI support to use and everything. Once you have basic systems running, like this. Okay. Behind you, please. Oh. What happens when the ETB gets full? Because I think you're saying 32 or 64K. Is it like override or is that configurable? Yeah, what happens yeah. No, so there's there's a trigger that can say stop when buffer full or at a certain level. Right. Or you can say you can leave it overflow. And so then like a flight recording like try to here. find a trace, the beginning or a synchronization point in the trace flow uh, based on the read and write pointers. Do you, have a, do you have any platforms with the TPRU or brought out? I, have, I don't have one. I, 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 I'd be super I'm really hoping for Juno to be TPIU enabled. I know there's a TPIU port on Juno. I just don't know if the connector is up. I haven't seen a Juno uh, like in the schematics to find out where the ports would be. Does, does the port is out? I haven't seen the port out. That the port would be out or would not? 
did not, well, if it's exposed, it's, it's multiplex with another pinout. All right, so um, people who want to ask more questions can stay uh, 10 minutes from now. We'll be starting the next session. Uh,